Hydro particle. It's a double-stranded DNA virus. It's also a non-enveloped virus. And if it enters into the host cells, uh, um, it goes into the nucleus and there it starts uh, replicating. During uh, this replication of the virus, um, also uh, um, intranuclear inclusion bodies are developed. Uh, and this is what we often see on um, histology sections. Uh, if we look to the histopathology, uh, with foul adenovirus, we often see this intranuclear uh, inclusion bodies, which you can see uh, on the picture uh, at the right side below. It's a very resistant virus uh, due to the fact that it is a non-enveloped virus. It's also very resistant. It can easily cope with uh, pH uh, changes. Uh, it can cope uh, with pH between three and nine. It's also resistant uh, to certain disinfectants um, and to lipid solvates because it doesn't have an envelope. And it also can cope, or some of the strains can cope with high temperatures as some strains can easily survive uh, for 30 minutes at temperatures are of 60 to 70 degrees Celsius. All these things, of course, uh, the fact that it is a quite resistant uh, virus makes that this virus uh, currently is worldwide distributed. Um, it was first reported in the 60s in the US. Um, uh, since then, it also has been reported in many parts of the world. But in the last decade, we really see a re-emergence of foul adenovirus-induced disease outbreaks uh, in chickens worldwide. If you look to the publications, during the last decade, many, many, many publications uh, have been uh, or have appeared about foul adenovirus outbreaks. It's omnipresent in poultry farms. You see it in chicken farms, turkey farms, also ducks, goose farms. Uh, foul adenovirus can be found there. It's also found in wild birds. And it seems that all ages of birds are susceptible for foul adenovirus. Looking into the classification of this virus, uh, foul adenovirus belongs to the family of the adenoviridae. And this family uh, can be divided in three subgroups. You have the group one avian adenoviruses. Today, they are called the avian adenoviruses. And this is really where foul adenovirus, uh, our topic of today, um, belongs to. But next to this group, you also have group two avian adenoviruses, an important member of this group, um, which certainly will be uh, recognized by people working in Turkey uh, industry is hemorrhagic enteritis virus. This belongs to group two avian adenoviruses. Um, and today this is called CIA adenovirus. And then we also have a group three uh, avian adenoviruses. And this is the group where egg drop syndrome belongs to. And this is called today the adenovirus. Looking to foul adenoviruses and the group one avian adenoviruses, uh, uh, this group can be subdivided into five species. And this uh, uh, the, the subclassification is done based on molecular um, criteria, so on restriction fragment patterns, uh, also on sequencing, uh, sequencing data. And today, five species have been recognized and they are designated with the letters A and E. So we have uh, species A, B, C, D, and E. There is also another classification system um, available, which is based on uh, virus neutralizing properties. And if we look into this classification system, you will see in literature uh, that multiple classification systems are available there. The two most commonly used today are the European and the US classification system. Both systems report 12 serotypes, but you will see uh, between the European and the US classification system, there is only partial overlap. And that's one of the things which makes it difficult today uh, because there are multiple classification uh, systems used uh, because next to the US and the European, 
There is also a different system used in Ireland. I think Japan also has a different system. This makes it very difficult um, to find consensus in literature about strains and the diseases. Here in this slide, I visualized a European classific uh, classification system and the US classification system. In my opinion, looking into literature, more and more people um, seems to use the European classification system. And I think this will also be a trend because uh, we really need a consensus there. Uh, I think this is a trend uh, under the scientists that they all are start to use uh, the European system today. Looking to literature and the uh, disease syndromes, which are frequently reported with uh, foul adenovirus, I think there are three main disease syndromes. Uh, one is, uh, which you can see on the right uh, side of the slide, is the gizzard erosion uh, syndrome. Another one which is frequently reported and also in Asia is hepatitis hydropericardium syndrome. And then I think the most well-known um, disease syndrome associated with um, foul adenovirus is inclusion uh, body hepatitis. Uh, which is those syndromes, but we will discuss them in the next slides, um, are most of the time associated with certain species, certain serotypes. Here uh, on this slide, uh, looking to the epidemiology and the distribution of the disease, um, this is a, a map. Uh, um, which was published uh, in an article, a review article about foul adenovirus from 2018. Um, it was published by the University of Vienna, the research, uh, research group there. And they actually uh, um, have colored uh, the different countries uh, where, uh, first of all, inclusion body uh, hepatitis have been reported. So all the red zones are zones where uh, um, articles are published about outbreaks with inclusion body hepatitis. Um, the arch zones are um, regions where you uh, see hydropericardium hepatitis syndrome. And then you have the uh, zones where uh, both syndromes are present. Uh, those are red colored and arch. So if you look to Asia, uh, you certainly can see uh, that both syndromes have been uh, reported uh, and are present uh, in Asia. And I think this map also makes it clear uh, that actually foul adenovirus is globally present. Looking uh, to some serological surveys that have been done, uh, um, antibodies to foul adenoviruses are reported in many, many broiler and breeder flocks worldwide. So this is also an indication of global distribution of the virus. If we look to isolation of the virus, uh, the virus has been isolated also uh, in many parts of the world, and this as well as from healthy as clinical affected birds. So also in healthy birds, foul adenovirus can be isolated. Looking further into transmission, both horizontal and vertical transmission seems to be important in the disease, um, but it is thought that vertical transmission is, to be, uh, is uh, the most important way of uh, spreading or seeding uh, forms with multiple stereotypes. What we also know uh, from investigating this virus is that birds can be infected with more than one serotype. Actually, it is uh, not uncommon if you try to isolate foul adenovirus that you will um, easily isolate two or three serotypes uh, from a flock. We also have seen that birds can excrete one serotype while having high levels of neutralizing antibodies to another serotype. What does this mean? Uh, the protection against foul adenovirus uh, primarily serotype specificus. So this means that there is little or no cross uh, protection between the serotypes. 
And what we also have seen uh, during uh, investigations and research is that um, sometimes birds can be latent carriers. So where, uh, what does this mean? That the virus, the foul adenovirus, get in a dormant sleeping status into the bird and that reactivation is possible even uh, after one year after infection and may result in subsequent reactivation and vertical transmission. So this makes it a quite challenging uh, disease or virus. Looking into vertical transmission specifically, um, uh, where do we see uh, most cases of vertical transmission? Uh, in breeders which have not seroconverted before lay. So often uh, if you have a breeder flock which uh, hasn't been uh, zero converted or had no contact with the virus during the rerun period. These are really flocks which are uh, really prone for infection during lay. And this infection, once the flock gets infected during lay, this will result in uh, virus shedding. This normally uh, lasts between four to eight weeks. Uh, and what we actually see is that virus shedding will stop once all breeders have seroconverted. So once all breeders show neutralizing antibodies, a uh, high level of neutralizing antibodies, then we also see that the virus uh, uh, shedding stops. Uh, and with the shedding, also the vertical transmission stops. And normally in a flock, when it, once it gets infected, this can take up to easily up to four to eight weeks, even longer. What we do need, uh, need to keep in mind is also, um, although uh, the virus uh, shedding may stop, you can have a uh, latent virus uh, in some birds, which can be reactivated whenever there is some stress. Also looking into breeders, uh, in which breeder flocks uh, do we often see a uh, foul adenovirus and subsequent, of course, vertical transmission that is our in breeders, which are uh, uh, what we called it clean house syndrome. So where there are high levels, but really high levels of biosecurity, also often seen in flocks uh, which are housed in new, uh, new houses, uh, you can uh, have issues or get easily issues with foul adenoviruses. Breeders with, which are living uh, between brackets, uh, because we all uh, do have some uh, biosecurity measures, of course, but which are living in more dirty houses or where we reuse litter, there you will see that there are less problems reported with foul adenovirus. So look, looking to two different scenarios, uh, um, these uh, on the y-axis, uh, y -axis, uh, you see uh, the percentage of positive breeders, which, uh, what do I mean with percentage of positive breeders? The breeders that have shown seroconversion. Uh, looking to the x-axis, this is the, uh, uh, the aging breeder here. Here you see at this time, this is where the breeder gets uh, into lay. If you see that breeder flock is seroconverting during lay, uh, that's actually what we do want, because normally uh, a breeder flock will get in contact with foul adenoviruses which are present uh, in this environment, uh, will seroconvert, and this will also prevent that risk transmission of these uh, serotypes uh, of active virus of these serotypes to the progeny. So in this way, uh, breeders are protected and you also prohibit a uh, vertical transmission uh, of those serotypes. Of course, if you have a breeding flock, and this is scenario two, which have not been in contact during the rearing phase, and then once it gets on the production farm, it gets infected, that's the flocks where you really get vertical transmission and this flock gets infected. And it can be that this flock only show limited or no symptoms itself, but you will have a lot of problems with foul adenovirus in the progeny. So if it gets infected during the lay, what you see is that there will be a period uh, in general uh, from four to eight weeks where the virus will be actively shedded, 
until all breeds are seroconvert and have high levels of neutralizing antibodies. And while shedding, you also will see that there is vertical transmission of active virus to the progeny, which will cause, of course, issues in the progeny. Looking to horizontal transmission, uh, horizontal spread uh, is also important um, for fowl adenovirus. Uh, the virus can be present in litter equipment. It can be brought into the houses with personnel um, and often uh, in poorly cleaned and disinfected houses, you will see um, that there is a certain level of fowl adenovirus present in the environment. And if you have issues with pathogenic strains of fowl adenovirus, uh, poorly cleaned and disinfected houses can um, be the reason why you will see issues uh, every round again. So it's really important if you do have really pathogenic strains in your broiler farm that you are uh, that you really clean your house well to get rid of these strains. Yeah. Um, the virus is present in feces, but it's also present in tracheal, nasal mucosae, and kidneys. You can uh, get infected by oral route, but also easily by um, respiratory route, although the oral fecal route seems to be the most uh, important um, in uh, horizontal uh, transmission. It's also the disease itself is commonly related with immunosuppression. So on farms where you do see issues with gumbro or chicken anemia virus, uh, you will also some, uh, often see fowl adenovirus. Looking to incubation times, uh, um, this go quite quick, uh, incubation time is one to two days. So now looking into the most commonly reported uh, disease syndromes, the first disease uh, syndrome, uh, which we will discuss, um, is the gizzard erosion and ulceration syndrome. This is also uh, called sometimes H adenoviral gizzard erosion uh, syndrome. This syndrome is mostly associated with species A or fowl adenovirus stereotype 1. Occasionally, also reports uh, have been published uh, where this syndrome was seen in combination with fowl adenovirus 8. Um, in experimental studies uh, where um, we isolate or where strains were isolated um, from the field, uh, where uh, flocks were uh, having this syndrome uh, and then birds were inoculated experimentally. It uh, we were possible to reproduce um, this disease. So it has been proved that fowl adenovirus on itself, stereotype one, can induce gizzard erosion and ulceration syndrome. What do we see on necropsy? Uh, um, the gizzards are distended uh, where the black arrow is. Uh, you also see some hemorrhagic fluid. In severe um, forms, you also will see black patchy erosions um, in the gizzard. And next to the gizzard lesions, um, also pancreatitis, proventriculitis, and hepatitis can be seen. Looking to the flock performance, uh, it's often seen with low mortality, uh, but what you uh, e uh, also will notice in those flocks is, is an uneven growth and an increased feed conversion range. Uh, of course, uh, this is not something where you typically would say uh, it's certainly fowl adeno. Uh, this also can point to other things, so you really need to differentiate. Think also about mycotoxins, uh, vitamin B6 deficiencies uh, can also uh, have a similar lesions. Looking to another frequently uh, reported uh, syndrome, uh, we are talking about hepatitis hydropericardium syndrome. And this syndrome was first reported in the 80s uh, in Pakistan. But since then, it has been reported in multi countries worldwide. The syndrome is mainly associated with serotype 4, so species C. It has been reported in broilers, but also uh, occasionally in breeder flocks and laying flocks. 
In general, you see it in birds of three weeks or all older, and there is a variability, uh, variable mortality. It can go from 20% to, in very severe forms, up to 80%. Um, looking on necropsy, what do you see? Uh, you typically see this pericarditis, so an increase also of the pericardial fluid, uh, heteropericardium, which you can also see on the picture, and often you also will see a hepatitis. Uh, sometimes this is also reported in combination with uh, immunosuppression. And then I think the most frequently reported disease syndrome, of course, is inclusion body hepatitis. This syndrome was first described in the US in the 60s, but at that time, of course, it didn't call inclusion body, uh, body hepatitis, it was called the three days disease. And why did, uh, or was it reported as the three days disease? Because if you look to the mortality pattern, it has a quite uh, typical pattern where you first see uh, during three days an increase in mortality, then you will reach a plateau phase where uh, the mortality remains uh, on the same level for three days. And then you will see a drop in mortality, which also will take approximately three days. Uh, and from there, it is called the three days disease. Looking to mortality, uh, um, mortality varies between 10 to 30% in affected flocks. It's usually seen in meat producing birds between three and seven weeks, so mainly in broilers, occasionally also in broiler breeders. What you see, uh, birds will be depressed, will be uh, showing signs of weakness. You also will see jaundice, convulsions, anorexia, and uh, some of the birds also will die. Looking to necropsy, what do you see there? What's typical there? Uh, um, you will have this enlarged, uh, which you also can see on the pictures above, this enlarged friable uh, livers. Uh, they will a bit, little bit uh, uh, have a yellow color also. What can you uh, see next to the liver lesions? Uh, also, often you will see a uh, pale necrotic pancre uh, uh, pancreas. Also, uh, bleedings in the muscles uh, can be seen, uh, and sometimes also bursal atrophy uh, is reported um, with inclusion body hepatitis. If we look to the breeders, a uh, breeder uh, doesn't show that many symptoms, but also mortality is reported, and sometimes uh, a drop in egg production or egg, ha egg hatchability uh, has been seen. So these are some, uh, or is a, a graph which show the offspring mortality. So on the y-axis, you have the percentage of mortality in the offspring. On the uh, x-axis, you see the age. And then you see, uh, certainly if you look to the green um, house, uh, this three-day pattern, where you have three days where um, mortality is increasing, then you get a, a kind of plateau phase, and then, uh, in the next three days, you see that mortality is dropping again. So from there, uh, we really had, or this disease is also called the three days uh, disease. Looking to serotypes uh, associated with inclusion body hepatitis, honestly, many serotypes uh, have been reported to be involved in this uh, disease syndrome. But looking to the ones which are most frequently reported uh, today at the serotype 2, 8A and B, and 11, those are really common, uh, commonly associated with um, inclusion body hepatitis. Traditionally, in the past, uh, it was often reported in combination with Gumbro and uh, chicken anemia virus. Uh, in the past, we also assumed that it was necessary to have first immunosuppression to get issues with foul adenovirus. Today, we know that certain strains of foul adenovirus are a primary pathogen on itself and can cause disease on itself. So it is today considered as a primary pathogen 
um, itself. Yeah. This is a case uh, with some pictures. This is a case from India where um, inclusion body, uh, body hepatitis was diagnosed and the flow showed cumulative mortality of a little bit more than 10%. Uh, and you see indeed uh, the, the livers which are affected. And uh, you see this enlarged livers, but also the friable livers and uh, the yellowish color. Also looking into the birds, uh, you really see the birds are depressed. Uh, and this all can be, uh, and although it's not certainly uh, only of adeno, but these are all signs which can point into the direction of foul adeno virus. So looking um, to diagnostic options, uh, what are we going to do when we suspect uh, our flock might be affected by foul adeno virus? There are a few options uh, which we can use and which are used today. I think for a long time in the, uh, uh, in the past, as the pathology was used, uh, it's still today considered as the gold standard. And what are we actually doing there? Uh, we are looking to the intracellular inclusion bodies, uh, which can be found in liver tissue, also in pancreas, proventriculitis, um, the gizzard, uh, in case of foul adenovirus, you can find uh, intracellular inclusion bodies. Of course, uh, this is not pathogen, uh, John, pathognomic for uh, foul adenoviruses alone. Uh, inclusion bodies can also be seen with other viruses. So that's one of the limitations. Uh, it gives you an indication, but uh, it's not. Uh, Conclusive. Looking to other options, uh, immunohistochemistry has been described. What are you going to do there? Uh, that's a technique where you also are going to look into um, tissue sections, but where you are going to use labeled antibodies to bind to the antigen in the tissues. And in this way, you will visualize the presence of antigen. Uh, if this happens, this is conclusive, then you know uh, at least there was virus present. Um, but this technique is only available in a very limited amount of labs. Uh, it's only available in specialized labs, research labs, where a lot of uh, investigations are done uh, purely on foul adenovirus. So this is not something which you can find uh, in every university lab, or it's really specialized. And then another diagnostic uh, tool, which is more commonly used today, of course, is virus isolation and PCR. What are we going to do with virus isolation and PCR? We are really going to detect uh, uh, the virus itself. Why can this be useful? Because if you have this virus, you can sequence, uh, it can give you a lot of strain information. Um, but what you do need to, uh, need to uh, realize is the PCR or the positive PCR or virus uh, uh, isolation uh, result on itself does not equal disease. As mentioned in the beginning of the presentation, foul adenovirus is omnipresent and can be isolated as well as from healthy flocks as from diseased flocks. So you really need to look to the full picture to to make the diagnosis of foul adenovirus. And then looking today, what's also commonly used for foul adenovirus is serology. There are uh, multiple serological assays uh, available. Looking to the past, uh, um, in the past, a lot of times, Ahergel immunodiffusion or Ahergel precipitation was used. This is a group specific test. So you are just going to show that there are antibodies against foul disease, uh, foul adenovirus um, present, but you are not looking into certain serotype. It's a, a group specific test. The counter side of this thing or uh, this uh, method is it lacks sensitivity and you re really need trained personnel um, to do it right. So if you look on the upper picture on the right side, this is a picture of um, Ahergel immunodiffusion, 
So what you are going to do is you have an agar where you have wells, and you made the wells into this agar. In the middle, you fill this uh, well with a uh, foul adenovirus antigen, and then in the wells next to it, you will uh, add serum samples. Often also control serum is added. And then you are going to look to precipitation lines, which are the white lines which you see in between of the wells. This is a signal of a positive result. So if you see a line, uh, this means there were antibodies present in the serum. Of course, uh, this technique is not that sensitive. Also, if you only have a low amount of antibodies, uh, it's very hard to read the results. So this is one technique. Another technique which is used in serology is the virus neutralization um, test. What you are going to do there is you have uh, a plate where you bring in uh, some cells. Uh, um, you also add virus and then you add um, also serum samples. If the serum sample um, contains antibodies, neutralizing antibodies, it will neutralize the virus and you don't will see any uh, cytopathological effects on the cells. If there is no um, antibodies present in the serum, then you will see that the virus in the well will uh, start replicating in the cells and will cause their uh, cytopathological effects due to the cells. It's a very complicated technique. But this is a serotype specific technique. So if you want a serotype information, this technique can be used. But it's time consuming, expensive, complicated, and only available in specialized labs. So looking honestly to today, uh, what's most frequently used as serological technique, then we are talking about ELISA. ELISA, also today's ELISAs uh, in literature, you will see already other ELISA, but the ELISAs today available uh, uh, worldwide are group specific ELISAs. Um, the advantage of an ELISA is the result, it's easy to do and it's easy to reproduce. So you get a good intra lab and intra lab uh, reproducibility of test results. It's also a less expensive technique and it allows automation mass testing uh, and it can be done uh, in every lab which has uh, uh, the possibility to do serology. Looking to biocheck, uh, um, we launched in 2011 already uh, a foul adenovirus ELISA. Um, if I look to the sales today, this ELISA is sold worldwide, so it's worldwide distributed. Um, and what we do detect uh, with this ELISA is antibodies against all serotypes. So it doesn't give any serotype information, it's a group specific ELISA. Uh, looking into the details, it's an indirect ELISA. Uh, um, so that's what we have on the market since 2011. Looking to the specificity of uh, the biocheck ELISA, uh, we did a lot of studies um, and we claim nowadays to have a specificity over 98%. On this slide, I, I show you um, a specificity study where we investigated 102 serum samples from SPF flux. And you can clearly see on this pictures that we uh, um, reported SP values uh, for these samples far below the cutoff of the test. So all samples are clearly negative. Uh, and in this specific study for SPF samples, 100% uh, specificity was seen. But in general, uh, let's say specificity is above 98%. When we started developing and validating the ELISA, uh, of course, we have also compared it to a technique which was then more commonly used, uh, which was agar gel immunodiffusion. We also compared uh, results to histopathology, which is still considered uh, as a golden standard. So, and in this study, uh, we um, looked into um, eight brilliant flux, which were suspected of foul adenovirus. 
um, serum samples were taken from those blocks. Also, tissue samples were taken for histopathology. And then you clearly see uh, on the right side, you have the biocheck ELISA results uh, and the flux, which were clearly positive on ELISA, were also um, positive on histopathology. So their uh, um, uh, intranuclear inclusion bodies were detected in the tissue samples. One of those flux was completely negative on agar gel immunodiffusion test. And this clearly shows the lack of sensitivity of this test. There was one flock which was just slightly positive according to the biocheck ELISA, but which was negative on the other methods. It was suspected, in my opinion, this is probably a, a, a flock which was just in an early uh, infection uh, and due to the, uh, the fact that it was slaughtered at 42 days, uh, uh, it just didn't long enough to show the, uh, um, the effects, the lesions, and the titers uh, on ELISA. Looking to F. adenovirus um, and the ELISA, as mentioned, uh, if I look to the sales today, um, we sell this kit in every part of the world currently. Why is it used? Uh, if I look to serology, uh, 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 to breeders, this is mainly used uh, to confirm the positive status of breeders before breeders are entering in production. And looking into field, um, uh, how do the people uh, um, use the results? Actually, what you want to see in burner breeders is that if you take samples between, let's say, 12 and 18 weeks of age, that at least 90% of the samples is positive. So that there is a zero conversion rate of 90% in the flock. And what we ideally would like to see is also that there is a low variation so that the CV is below 35%. If you see this, then you know there wasn't a good uh, um, contact with foul adenovirus during um, the rearing phase. And then you also know that this flock will have ne neutralizing antibodies against the serotypes present uh, in the environment. If you see, uh, you take samples and you see uh, this flock is not seroconverted well, if you take them between 12 and 18 weeks, you also have time enough to uh, take uh, um, corrective actions if, if the flock is not super converted. Uh, you can also, uh, you can last minute decide still uh, because there is still time enough to vaccinate the flock. Uh, today, there are a few commercial vaccines available, but also um, my opinion in the field, a lot of autogenous vaccines are used. Why? Because in these autogenous vaccines, you can make combinations of the uh, serotypes which are important uh, in your region and uh, the serotypes which give uh, most problems in your region. So that's one of the reasons uh, why ELISA is commonly used today in breeders. Um, also in production, uh, uh, often people look, what you really want to have uh, when you monitor a flock in production is that the mean flock titer is above 10,000 uh, and that you also have 90 to 100 percent of the birds which are still converted. And I must say, okay, uh, we do see from time to time flocks with really poor serial conversion into production. And these are flocks which are really, yeah, dangerous. These uh, are flocks which can be infected during uh, um, during production and which will uh, give them vertical transmission. Um, looking to interpretation, it can sometimes be difficult. What I do see is once you start using ELISA, once you do it on a routine base, uh, you get used to what you see, you know what's normal and abnormal. Uh, and in that way, once you get used with serology, you easily know, um, oh, this flock might be at risk. I need to vaccinate, or this flock uh, was well um, uh, uh, infected naturally and showed a good natural uh, uh, serial conversion due to a natural infection. 
What you do need to keep in mind is, of course, uh, it's not because you do see uh, positive titers uh, that is necessarily correlate with protection. As mentioned before, protection is stereotype specific. So if another stereotype suddenly uh, gets into the flock, you can get a new infection with this new stereotype. Looking to the baselines, we've set for um, breeders, uh, and of course, these are provisional baselines, uh, and we always recommend, once you start monitoring, to set your own baselines. But looking into broiler breeders, um, uh, if we look to natural infection, or if we look to broiler breeders which were vaccinated with an inactivated vaccine, in general, mean titers are seen between 12,000 12, to 30,000, uh, uh, let's say four to six weeks after infection or vaccination. Um, and what you really want is a TV below 35%, and you want to have at least 90% of the birds which are seroconverted. I would say when you apply inactivation, uh, you really need to have 100% seroconverted. So looking to some results, um, these are um, customer results. Um, this is a broiler breeder flock at 10 weeks, and you here see uh, um, yeah, that there is an initial start of the zero conversion. So uh, you only see low titers, but you see there is a natural infection, and this is infection. Um, there is still a negative bird here, uh, and this is actually, if you want to get your breeders uh, uh, into production, you would like to have to see at least 90%, 200% conversion. This is a flock at 70 we uh, 17 weeks, uh, and here you already see high titers, but still a lot of variation between the birds. So uh, ideally, you want to see that the seroconversion is going to continue still, and that the variation is going down. Uh, because if you look to this result, you still have 68% uh, CV, which is really too high um, if you want to uh, have some assurance that the flock will be protected against the serotypes in the environment. You really want to go for a CV below 35%. And these are um, two flocks which are into production. Uh, and I think it's clear the flock on the right side. This is really an ideal example of what you want to have. And uh, you want to have high CVs, low variation. Uh, so this is really the example where you would like to, to strive to uh, and which is showing a good zero conversion. Here uh, you see a lot of variation. These are flocks which, which are still at risk. Eh? Although there is your conversion due to the high variation, you will have birds which only will have a limited amount of neutralizing antibodies and which will be therefore not protected. So this is an example of poor your conversion. And this is actually a flock which is now into production, which is at risk. Uh, other example uh, of two broiler breeder flocks. Um, you have flock A, uh, and I think you clearly see this. Uh, this flock has a mean titer below 5,000 uh, and a high CV or high CV at still at 35. Um, and then you have flock B, which has high mean titer at above 25,000 uh, and a low CV, approximately 15%. Uh, and I think you, uh, uh, I think you all see it. Uh, of course, flock B is a flock which is protected uh, to the stereotypes uh, in the environment there. Uh, and of course, flock A is really a flock which is at risk uh, um, during the production for vertical transmission. Um, these are two other examples. Uh, on the right side, you have a broiler breeder flock, which is 18 weeks, uh, and which really shows you a good zero conversion. Uh, um, you have a CV of 20%, a high mean titer uh, uh, of 23,000. 
On the right side, this is a field example from a broiler breeder flock of 26 weeks, which show a poor circumversion. Eh? Although you have high mean titers, because some of the birds eh, have high levels of neutralizing antibodies, you also have eh, birds with low levels of neutralizing antibodies, eh, and therefore this flock is still at risk. Eh, um, and this is eh, something you can see um, when looking to the CV. And eh, this flock still has a CV of 53% which shows you clearly that there is a lot of variation in the level of antibodies um, uh, uh, present in the animals. So you will have animals which are protected and you also will have animals which are still at risk for infection in this flock. This is uh, a nice case, um, which was, I think, published in 2012. Um, it was a case of vertical transmission, which was reported in Germany. Um, and the disease syndrome, which was seen, was um, adenoviral gizzard uh, erosion syndrome. So what happened, um, they didn't, or uh, this um, integration didn't uh, look into um, fowl adenovirus, they didn't monitor at that time. I can assure you they do nowadays, but uh, at that time they didn't monitor the breeder flux uh, for fowl adenovirus. Uh, so this flux went to an, into production and um, at a certain stage, they saw, uh, I, I think the flock was just, yeah, shortly into production between 29 to 32 weeks of age. Um, they saw a slight decrease in um, egg hatchability, but the egg production was still normal. But what did they see later in the progeny there they got um, the disease syndrome. So in the progeny, multiple flocks um, originating from this uh, breeder flock um, showed uh, adenoviral gizzard erosions. Um, so at that time, uh, this company uh, contacted us um, to ask if they could use our ELISA. They still had serum samples and this uh, uh, analysis clearly showed what happened. Eh? So you have here the three houses of the breeder flock. Um, these were serum samples which they collected at 25 weeks. If we look to um, when the problems were uh, reported in the progeny, uh, probably the infection must have occurred uh, around 27 weeks, uh, um, or at least in some of the houses. Um, if you look to the 25 samples, uh, you here see this flock was completely negative in house one, also the, uh, in house two, completely negative uh, on ELISA. In um, house three, it is positive on ELISA, but only very limited. Uh, in general, I think you should strive, uh, certainly in production, to mean flock titer of both yeah, 10 to 12,000. So this is really just slight slight positive. So this flock uh, was in production and of course uh, was at risk because it didn't have uh, neutralizing antibodies. So they got infected during uh, production and then you see the samples on 29 weeks where you see a clear increase in the antibody titer. So this clearly shows the impact of the infection on the breeder flock. And the breeder flock uh, there were not that much symptoms, um, only uh, a drop in hatchability, uh, hatchability. but uh, looking to the progeny there, they had really tremendous um, lesions uh, at gizzards. Um, so this was really big case. I think at the end, more than 20 broiler farms uh, were, were affected. Uh, I can assure you, after this lesson, this integration is, until nowadays, monitoring this breed of flux for zero conversion before lay. Another um, reason why serology is often used in broiler breed of flux is to monitor vaccination. If you are um, having flux which um, uh, 
or in the reading phase, uh, not uh, naturally infected or only show a poor seroconversion, then you do see that vaccination can bring some solution. And what you do then in that case is often autogenous vaccines are used. Um, and in those autogenous vaccines, um, they make combinations of the strains which are present um, in the environment, in the region, and which are causing issues in that certain reason, uh, uh, region, and you are going to vaccinate your breeder field. And then uh, after vaccination, you're going to look uh, for antibody titers. Uh, uh, you're actually going to monitor the vaccine. And there you want to the same. Uh, you would like to have high antibody levels and a low CV. And that's clearly uh, in this picture, you clearly see the vaccination effect. This is a nice example of a very good vaccination. These are also uh, some samples. These are uh, multiple flux from the same um, integration. They all get, uh, got the same um, vaccine. Uh, and then you see uh, they all uh, see more or less the same response. And in this way, if you have autogenous vaccines, uh, you can also um, make for yourself baselines where you say in this case, uh, my flock needs to be at least uh, if vaccinated at eight weeks and I take them samples, uh, let's say four to six weeks later, uh, you need to have a CV higher than 18,000 to be able to say the vaccination was successful. So this is also uh, how you can use ELISA uh, to monitor your foal adenovirus uh, vaccination. Looking to broilers and serology in broilers, um, foul adenovirus ELISA is also used in broilers um, in regions where there is a lot of pressure. Um, sometimes they all chicks are screened. Uh, why? Because you want to look to the maternal antibody transfer and you want to uh, assure yourself um, that there are neutralizing antibodies present in the day-old chicks, which will protect them uh, during the first life, uh, days of life. If you have a lot of uh, negative titers, uh, group zero titers, then of course, uh, you know, these are negative uh, and there are broilers which can easily be infected at the day of age. Again, uh, also here, uh, the same rule comes. Positive titers do not necessarily correlate with protection. Uh, again, protection is serotype specific, not group specific. And I'll show you some um, results of the old checks um, from one of the customers who frequently look uh, to this. Uh, um, you see also there, uh, uh, there can be uh, a lot of variation, but in general, if uh, you have breeders from uh, um, broilers originating from a breeder flock that is well seroconverted, you also will see uh, um, quite high titers in bro uh, the day old chicks. Uh, and also, there uh, you would like to see that all day old chicks are having uh, a certain level of antibodies. Uh, if you have um, the old chicks without antibodies, and uh, these birds are not protected. And in the second example, here you see there are two birds uh, uh, which show uh, no seroconversion, but here uh, you see half of the birds uh, does not have seroconversion. Uh, and this is really a flock in a high press pressure area, which is at risk for an early infection. Looking to slaughterhouse um, samples, uh, samples which are taken at slaughterhouse and broilers, honestly, there is limited data available today, but from um, customers who do monitor, uh, what we do see is, and also from internal investigations we did, you will see also in healthy broiler flocks, uh, low positive results. In general, uh, in my opinion, uh, mean titers below 3,000 um, uh, can be seen in broilers older than 35 days of age without any problem, yeah? So which is just a normal result. 
what we do see is that clinically affected flocks in general have higher mean titers. My opinion, it's often above 6,000 when you take samples uh, in broilers older than 35 days of age. But again, uh, if you would do um, broiler monitoring, my advice is uh, um, to get some feeling, uh, compare, um, uh, take samples from healthy flocks and clinically affected flocks uh, and compare. Um, I think that's the most easy way to get us somehow used to what is normal and what's abnormal uh, and make your own baselines. But that's based uh, on the experience we have. That's what we uh, today use as a professional baseline. So uh, these are some uh, results from flux we monitored. Uh, and again, this is a uh, flux C, but it shows already a titer, mean flux titer above 4,000. But this is a flux which is non-clinical, no, no issues were reported in this flux. So uh, that's what I want to say. You can have flux where you do see titers where there are no issues. Uh, that's something you need to realize. But in general, if the flock is affected, you will see higher titers. Uh, and this is a case of inclusion body, uh, inclusion, uh, body hepatitis in Spain. Uh, in this broiler flock, first symptoms were seen between 13 and 16 days uh, of age. Uh, what was seen in the farm was that the birds were depressed, uh, lethargic, and there was also acute mortality rate. Uh, the mortality peaked three to five days after the start of the symptoms, and it disappeared after six to seven days. So uh, this also fits in this three days disease um, uh, syndrome. Total mort mortality at slaughter, uh, uh, depending on the house, uh, varied between eight and 30%. On necropsy, enlarged livers were seen, friable livers, um, also, nephritis was reported. Um, the samples for histology and also there at uh, this intracellular uh, inclusion bodies uh, were uh, seen in liver and kidney. These are some pictures um, uh, from um, necropsy uh, from the birds. And these are the results. So on the top, you see one of the farms which was, uh, or the houses which was affected, and these samples were taken at 38 days. Uh, and in this case, serotype eight uh, was involved. Um, but you see a mean titer of 15,000, uh, and you clearly see all births uh, show seroconversion. You see a low CV. Uh, in this case, it was 28%. And this is something a typical uh, picture for uh, a clinically affected flock, broiler flock. This is a non-clinical flock, and uh, this was a flock with, without any symptoms, uh, and you see here at slaughter age, and it was already uh, uh, more than uh, 88 later because this flock was sampled at uh, 46 days uh, of age. You only see a mean titer of uh, below 2,000. Uh, and a CV of more than 40%. And this is really, uh, as explained, you can see some seroconversion in non-clinical flocks. Why? Because we do know that adenovirus is present in the environment of many farms, many flocks. Uh, again, uh, a non-clinical flock versus a clinical flock. Uh, I think once you start monitoring, you really know uh, uh, what you can expect and what you can consider as normal uh, and abnormal. Uh, I think the difference between both flocks is quite clear. This is uh, the house uh, which I showed the data before. Uh, at the start of the clinical symptoms, 16 days. Uh, um, in this case, samples were taken for fowl adenovirus. Uh, and you, sh you see that this, at that uh, age, this flock was still negative. Uh, and then at 38 uh, days, uh, you clearly see the increase in titer, but also uh, you see the CV going down. So all uh, birds in the flock are circumverting uh, more or less to the same titer. Looking to uh, controlling of the disease, I think uh, to control the disease, 
ELISA and monitoring is absolutely a useful tool, but next to this, of course, and you need, also need to take action. Uh, first of all, prevent immunosuppression. It is uh, uh, reported a lot in the past, and it is uh, also nowadays seen. If you have immunosuppressive disease, this opens the door uh, uh, for a subsequent foul adenovirus uh, infection. And next to this also biosecurity uh, is important. Uh, um, if you look to breeders, uh, beware of the clean new house syndrome, of course, uh, because then you will get probably breeders which go into production um, without having a zero conversion. So uh, naive birds which are going into production and are at, at risk for infection during production. Um, if you have pathological strains present in the environment uh, and you see in certain broiler farms, uh, whenever you uh, put new birds in, that there is a, a horizontal infection due to a pathogenic strains in the environment, uh, one of the disinfectants which can help you uh, to, to lower the pressure or to solve the issue is formaldehyde. Uh, then um, a good tool, ELISA, you need to screen all breeder flocks to ensure they are still converted before going into lay. Once neutralizing antibodies are present uh, against those serotypes in the environment, shedding will generally stop. Uh, so what you should strive is, are the flock gets infected uh, by natural exposure during rearing, or you are going to use vaccines. Uh, um, there are some live unattenuated vaccines available in Australia. Um, there are also inactivated commercial vaccines uh, available. In my, uh, to my knowledge, this is mainly through type four, five, and eight. Um, and then what I do see quite a lot in different regions uh, where issues are seen with foul adenovirus is the use of autogenous vaccines. And in those cases, what uh, the people do is they combine the strains which are causing problems in that region. Looking to other applications, uh, uh, it's also used uh, to monitor, of course, SPF flocks uh, to confirm their negative status, then breeders, uh, natural seroconversion as discussed, also vaccination monitoring of breeders, and then uh, this is last stage, and this is, of course, actually where you do not want to end, but if you avoid all the other things, and then you get disease, it's also used in disease monitoring in breeders. But this is actually something I would not recommend. I think it's better to prevent disease and to monitor early in life and to take uh, all necessary actions then uh, to make sure the flock is uh, uh, to a certain level protected than to do disease monitoring later in life. And then in broilers, uh, if we look to the application of ELISA in broilers, uh, in high pressure uh, regions, DL check monitoring can be done uh, to monitor the maternal antibody transfer and to uh, guarantee the broiler chicks are protected during the first days uh, of life. Then also uh, next to that, it's also often used for disease monitoring in broilers. Um, at older than 35 days of age. Uh, but again, we do have some data and baselines there, but I would say if you start into this, please do make your own baselines. And then in a few countries, but this is very limited, we also see if they do have a lot of issues that vaccination is sometimes applied in broilers. And then you can also look to the success of vaccination there. So uh, to summarize, I think uh, based on the data we see, um, and this is really also uh, uh, due to uh, speaking to people in the field, but also uh, based on the publications, I think we can conclude that foul adenovirus is worldwide present. Um, there are a wide range of manifestations. Uh, infections can go from mild to very severe forms uh, of clinical disease in poultry. 
Um, but to make a diagnosis of the disease, uh, it's really a combination. Uh, you need to combine the clinical history together with serology, molecular techniques, histopathology can also be useful there. Uh, but to make a diagnosis, you really need to combine it. And I think uh, um, I can say that ELISA is a useful tool to monitor and to control foul adenovirus in your blood. And prevention really starts uh, by monitoring breeder flux uh, for seroconversion. And also uh, one of the things you need to assure uh, in breeding flux is that you avoid immunosuppression there. That's the end of the presentation. Uh, I can't see if there were many questions, uh, but I think there is still some time uh, left to discuss these. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Shantina. That was really a very good presentation. And uh, so now it's clearer for us uh, how to manage this uh, emerging disease in, in Asia. Actually, we have here uh, several questions uh, for yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> so let me see. So some of them I already uh, uh, put into one because some are, are almost the same. So. We can okay. start, I think. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the first question here: uh, If a flock has a poor zero conversion, uh, yeah. is revaccination indicated or is it necessary? Yeah, I would say if you are in a region uh, where there is a high pressure or where multiple cases of foul adenovirus are reported, then I would really recommend uh, to to vaccinate a flock. And that's also why I think you should monitor between 12 and at the latest 18 weeks, because if you at that stage, uh, stage C or at that age, that is uh, zero conversion is still poor, you do have enough time to vaccinate the flock still. If you do it later, uh, then there is no way you can still interact uh, and then you're just waiting until uh, a problem occurs. So. Uh, my opinion start monitoring on a, an early age so that you do have enough time uh, to take uh, extra actions if needed uh, in the case of course your conversion yeah but i certainly would recommend um to vaccinate if you are in regions where uh yeah foul adenovirus is uh, having a lot uh, or posing a lot of issues yeah Okay, uh, next uh, we have here uh, for non-vaccinated flock, what should be the expected uh, tighter range and uh, CV prior to lay? And there's prior a follow-up. Yeah, yeah, I would say uh, if you monitor between 12, uh, the mean tighter uh, at that stage is not that important. What you do need to absolutely have is if you monitor between 12 and 18 weeks, at least 90% of the birds should show zero conversion. If it's less than 90% of, uh, of the birds, then you do have an issue. And I would say ideally you go to a CV also at around 35% of lower, so that there is not that much variation between the titers of the birds. Um, that's the main uh, things where you should look at um, non-vaccinated birds between 12 and 18 weeks, uh, weeks of age. In general, I always like titers above 10,000, but uh, is it 9,000, it will be also okay. Okay, so as a follow-up for that question, Gentina? So follow up for the non-vaccinated flock. If you have a conf if you have confirmed a good circumversion prior to the lay in the flock, what tighter range and CV should we expect from the same flock during its production? During production, um, so in general, you will see from flocks which are circumverted well during lay, they will have at least titers between 12 and I would say 30,000, 25, 30,000. What you can see during lay is um, because uh, also in the production farm, uh, often foul adenovirus is present in the, the farm, uh, that titers may be increased slightly and go 
So uh, you will see that birds also will get some contact there, but that's something uh, they should in general be above at least 12,000. Mm. And also, again, uh, you should have, my opinion, ideally 100% of the birds here converted during production. Eh? Okay, okay. So next. So we have still a lot, Gentina. Are you okay with that? <laughs> Okay. Early morning for me. That's right. It's early morning for you. It's in late in the afternoon for us. Anyway, here it is. So, based on your presentation, that it mean does it mean that only heavy breeds, meaning the broilers and the broiler breeders, are affected? How about how about the commercial layers or the PS? Yeah, so um, honestly, most reports are indeed uh, in broilers and broiler breeders. Uh, but on the other side, there are also uh, reports in SPF flocks and in layers. Um, one of the disease syndromes, which is, in my opinion, also quite often seen in layers is the gizzard erosion uh, syndrome. This is also reported uh, into layers and quite Frequently, if you look to the layer um, uh, problems there uh, with Fraudino virus, occasionally you also will see uh, inclusion body hepatitis or um, um, oh, let me think. <laughs> um, yeah, occasionally was, you will also see the other uh, other disease syndromes and layers. So it's not that layers are not affected. But they are affected, and yeah, in my opinion, uh, they are affected lesser than uh, other flocks. Okay, so I think that answers also the question here that uh, what is the incidence of uh, fall adenovirus for commercial layers? It's actually connected to that question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I don't have a real percentage, uh, but I can uh, assure you it has been seen, has been reported uh, into layer flux as well, but to a lesser extent. And why? Uh, also, if you look to broiler breeders, most of the diagnoses are made because of issues in the progeny. And of course, with commercial layers, this is something where you don't, uh, you don't see there is no progeny. It's used from commercial eggs. And therefore, probably uh, this is a disease is less frequently also reported and seen in layers. Okay, so I think we still have more time, right, Doc Mon? <laughs> Ten minutes more. So here's some more question for you. So Yantina, you said the autogenous vaccine is best for protection, and as far as we know, unlike in India and other Southeast Asian countries, we do not have yet any commercial vaccines available here in yeah. the Philippines. Do you have yeah. any survey to confirm the need for vaccination here? Or do you think we should consider vaccination to, to our flocks yeah. here in the Philippines? <laughs> if you do, and I don't know uh, how frequently it's currently uh, seen or issues are seen with foul adenovirus and broilers, but if you do see it quite a lot, um, uh, to get some control on the disease, uh, uh, because vertical transmission will also play a major role uh, probably there, then I would recommend to start isolating um, the strains. That's the first step you need to do, uh, start isolating strains. Look which strains are uh, causing issues and are present um, in your region. And based on that, if there are really a lot of issues, I think the first thing, and because then you also, I would also start monitoring the breeder flocks at to look, are they really circumverted before going uh, into lay? If that's not the case, or if you still have a lot of issues with foul adenovirus, my opinion, uh, autogenous vaccines with the strains present in your region is really key in getting a first uh, step into uh, yeah, eliminating or reducing the issues with foul adenovirus. Yeah. OK. Yeah. So uh, I think uh, this should be the last. Uh, you mentioned that the uh, percentage positive is more important uh, when monitoring titers of FAV prior to laying. Yeah. However, 
if we obtain a very uniform titer with about uh, more than 15,000 mean titer in unvaccinated flock without clinical signs, what does this mean? Can it say something about the disease challenge in the area? Um, yeah, this is certainly an indication <laughs> that there is adenovirus then present. Um, on the other hand, uh, this is also a good sign in my opinion. What you see uh, uh, is in breeder flux during um, uh, uh, rearing. Um, if they get into uh, contact with strains present in the environment, uh, they, you see they will build antibodies. Uh, as long as these are low pathogenic strains in the environment, they will offer your breeders protection, neutralizing antibodies uh, uh, to avoid vertical transmission. So even if you have titers of 15,000 or 25,000 uh, in non-vaccinated flocks, I really like to see these high titers because then I know my flock at least has neutralizing antibodies against the serotypes at present on that farm or in that region and are offering a pro or uh, in that way also uh, due to the neutralizing antibodies, vertical transmission is avoided. Yeah. So I don't see a high titer as a negative thing. I think uh, you should look to it uh, as a positive thing. Uh, also, if the flock was not vaccinated, I think you should try to strive to titers of at least 10,000 or higher. Okay. So I said it's the last, but this is the last one. <laughs> Sorry. Actually, no there's still a lot of questions, but uh, no. last one. So, and then for, for the others, please, please feel free to contact me, Doc Mon uh, or Luis, your, your additional questions. And we, will be, we are more than happy to assist you. And uh, we can also forward your questions to Yantina. Yeah. Okay. So la one last, so really the last one. <laughs> is there any indication in the ELISA of the day-old chick that the breeders are shedding? Uh, no, uh, no, no. Uh, the day old chicks, if you monitor day old chicks, you only look to the maternal antibody transfer. And honestly, um, there is no indication there um, about shedding. Um, of course, uh, if you only have low antibody levels, maternal antibody levels, or uh, the births are completely negative, then you of course can question what's happening in the breather flow. Mm -hmm. um, but there is no, yeah, no direct uh, indication uh, about shedding or not shedding of the breathers. Okay, so for the others, uh, your questions are all noted. We'll get back to you definitely, don't worry. Uh, there's still a lot of questions. It's actually good questions, but uh, <laughs> yeah. But I'm sorry, more than happy to, yeah, yeah. Them, uh, yeah, don't worry, we'll send them also to you. Uh, okay. Those questions, all those questions are noted uh, for everybody. Okay, so Doc Juan. Okay. Um, Thank you very much, Doc Lu. Antina, that was a very nice presentation. Uh, Thank you very I've learned, much. I've learned a lot. Huh? I've learned a lot. That's good. That's good. I'm <laughs> already old, but uh, it's not late to learn. Anyway, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for your time. Uh, we know that this is just an hour and a half, but uh, this does not end here. It's just the start of our relationship. You throw us your questions and whatever help we can do, we will try to do it with you in cooperation with my partners, Doc Lu and uh, Hantina, of, uh, who is on the other side of the planet. Uh, <laughs> I would like to ask uh, a while ago how we can isolate or uh, isolate the strains that are present in the Philippines. Maybe Hantina can help us offline. Yeah where we can send samples so we yeah. can uh, isolate Absolutely. Yeah. and maybe perhaps uh, do some uh, uh, autogenous vaccines while waiting for a commercial vaccine in the Philippines. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, again, I thank you. Maraming salamat po sa inyong oras. I know you're all busy and we thank you for your interest in the topic that we have presented before you. We will appreciate more topics from you and we will try to share with you whatever information they have, whatever is out there in the field. So uh, thank you very much. Good afternoon and have a nice day, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.
Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dan.